I want to welcome my good friend, Pastor Doug Gerasik with me this morning. Let me tell you about Pastor Doug. I've known him for such a long time. He's a, he's a Viking from uh, Ohio. And he's going to tell you guys that apparently nobody's eating their dogs and no. cats <laughs> in Ohio. Um, apparently, just because he still has his, uh, he bears testimony of that today. Uh, Pastor Doug and his wife, Stephanie, has planted this beautiful church called Rust City. How, how awesome that you can call your church Rust City. Right, when you're there, it is like here. Kindred homes, kindred spirits. And he was in town and I um, said to him, you've got three boys, little terrors, just like him. The most beautiful little kids. And uh, Pastor Doug is, um, is such a blessing because God has um, really um, bestowed on them a gift of faith and influence and wisdom. And, you know, we often listen to a message, but not often do we talk frankly about how does it work in real life. We listen to it and we go like, oh yeah, that's beautiful. Um, but how does it play out? And I thought, hey, what if Pastor Doug and I talk about it and he doesn't know what questions I'm going to ask and, and I don't know what questions he's going to shoot back at me. Um, because we've been speaking last week what the world needs right now. And this is the, the slide, really, uh, for the series, What Does the World Need? Because we live in a time right now of um, huge uncertainty, um, uh, political Mm. Let's not find a word because you may vote for that word. I mean, they're just this thing. Um, and four years ago, brothers turned against brothers and sisters against sisters, thinking that whoever we get voted in is going to change the world. And I go like, let's learn from the last time. Uh, some trust in horses and chariots, but we're going to trust in the name of the Lord. Um, we're not going to divide the family over who we think is going to do whatever, but we're all going to vote, but we, we'll get there. But what does the world need right now? And we said in the beginning of time, Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, and the earth was a bottomless emptiness, an inky abyss. It was dark. And darkness is not a force. It's just the absence of light. And the very first thing that God said, remember God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because the Bible says in the beginning, Elohim, God. The word Elohim is plural. And God spoke light. Light is the first thing. And if you say, is that a disco ball? Yes, it's a disco ball. Woo -woo. Uh -huh. This is the closest some of you are going to get to disco and you say, Pastor P, why um, are you doing this? Because ultimately Jesus came in John chapter 1 and the Bible says, and he, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. He was there when the earth was the inky abyss. He became flesh and he says, and he, in him is light. And the light was the light of man. And the light was life giving and life making. Oh, I love that. In other words, it's not just light. It's life giving and life making. And then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If you walk with me, follow me, you'll never walk in darkness. And we say, what does the world need? I can say the world needs kindness. The world needs this. The world needs that. But can I tell you what the world needs? Because scripture talks about darkness that is unseen to us, but mostly seen by God. He says, is covering the earth. And the only way that you fight darkness is not with more information and opinion. You fight it by showing up as light. Now, if you were raised in any kind of Sunday school, you remember this little light of mine. Mm -mm -mm, I'm going to let it shine. Boom, boom, boom. This little light. Oh, see, see you all. Did you ever get to the... Don't let the devil 
it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Ever did it? I'm gonna let you try it. Don't let the devil it out. Uh, can I tell you something? The Bible says nothing can extinguish the light. There's no in it out. Because you and I are not light. Christ is the light. Well, right? Christ is the light. So for me to go anywhere and go like, I'm the light. No, you're not the light. You are but a mirror on a disco ball. We are this beautiful. There's no church organization or congregation that says we are the light. No, no, no. You're just another mirror. And the only light that we can bring is to be in proximity with Christ the light. And when we're in our proximity with Christ, then our lives reflect the light. But now John comes and he says this really interesting scripture that we're going to visit today and talk about in all practicality. John says this. Come on, let's read together. This is the message we've heard from Jesus and now declared to you. Come on. God is light and there's no darkness in him. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, he says we, we are all walking every day. And even people that are disability are walking in their heart, in their faith, in their life. And he says there's only two places you can choose to walk. By default, if you walk in the light, then there is no darkness. But if you pull away from the light, darkness is inevitable. There's no no man's land. You can't say, well, I don't believe in all of this. I'm just going to stay neutral. There's no such thing. Yeah, there's either light or there's no light. But then John talks nine times. He warns us about the enemy to the light. And he used this word sin. Now sin. Sin is an interesting thing. Because many of you may have been in a church. All they talk about is sin. Ever heard of you Jezebel take off that eyeliner. <laughs> right. Why are you wearing those red shoes it's only the blood of Jesus that's red <laughs> believers don't wear red shoes and why is your skinny jeans so skinny and, and why is that and and pastor Doug I want to uh, uh, ask this question uh, since we we become so um, we are so weary not to become a people and I don't understand that when we talk about sin, first of all, we don't want to acknowledge it that sin is fun. Right? I've got one truthful heart in church. Sin is fun. If it was terrible, you wouldn't have done it. There's something in sin that's attractive to the fallen human heart. You don't go like, oh, it's so terrible to sin, but I'm just going to have to do it. No, no, because sin is seeking the things that is very normal, but it is seeking it in a way that's very destructive. Pastor Doug, how would you describe sin so that we understand how damaging it is to the proximity? What is sin and why why is it that when we describe it, people either become sin investigators and that feels their job to point everybody's sin out, or it's so inconsequential that we now live in it and think we can walk in the light? And the Bible says that's practicing a lie. Could you start with an easier question next time, a little bit less? No. <laughs> Do we have to go right into the deep end off oh, the jump of this? Jump in. Jump in. Can I I didn't get to say this last time, and I want and I felt convicted that I didn't say, and I want to say it this time. I love you and Pastor Marley so very much. 
My wife loves you. You have been our pastors for over 10 years. You have been there in my darkest moments. You've been there in some of my best moments. And I, without a doubt, know that I would not be in the position or person I am today without you in my life. And you mean more to me than I can ever have words to put into that. But I thank you for just being you, Pastor P, so stinking much. And Marlise, Mama. Oh. Steph and I just, our lives are just immensely better because you're in it. Now, let me answer your question, okay? I do believe, and I, and I don't know this for you, but I know this for me, that honor is kingdom currency for where God will take you. And let me just encourage you with this thought. If you don't know how to honor, you're robbing yourself of where God wants to take you on your journey. And those who complain and just don't know, I, I don't want to say things about you at your death someday that I wouldn't say to your face today. And, and I think too many of us, we're missing our moments to tell people in our lives how much you mean to me. Fair? Okay, so I'll that's, answer your question. That's how I'm sorry. Is escaping the question. Yeah, I'll right answer your question. I'll answer your question. <laughs> flattery. I'm just going to flatter you. No, no. I deeply, I deeply appreciate it. So here's the question. <laughs> what is sin? What makes sin sin? And why has it become inconsequential? Because he says, you practice it. You want forgiveness from it, but you stay practicing it. Talk to us. My own personal experience and what I teach is I notice that sin is like sugar. And I know that sugar doesn't help me so many situations when I get hungry and I'm like, man, I, I should eat something healthy, but this seems so much more appealing. And I grab it. And in the moment, sin never feels bad. Just like eating that candy bar, it does not feel bad going down. But within a few moments, in a certain season, it hits me that I'm realizing I am that one degree of separation, which I personally believe that sin is a separation from God's plan and a separation, and he tells us things through the word. But that one degree over time creates a catechism and in such a valley where now I don't realize where I'm at and I become so toxic in my spirit. I'm so malnourished in my soul. And I might love this idea of God, but I, I have a form of it, but I lack the power of it because I've been nourishing my soul with something that is synthetic, not the real thing. And all of a sudden, I wonder why when I need the power of God, when I need it to stand firm in my moments of weakness, I don't have the strength that I thought I had. And my, what, what I've realized for me, at least, Pastor, is I had to come to a place where I said, my flesh loves to sin. It is in me. I can't shake it. You taught me Jesus might be in my heart, but grandpa's still in my bones. Yes. And, and, I, and I might still have these instincts that are carnal by nature, but I give up something that I love for something that I love more. And there's a God who's inviting me not to... I used to think of sin as God was just a fun sucker. He didn't want me to have a good time. So he was trying to make me like not have a good life. And what I realized was on the other side of trusting him, there's a better life for me than the sin that I was living in. And there's a purpose. See, some of us right now, we're, we're like struggling with purpose. And it's like, oh, I gotta be willing to let go of something I love and pick up something I love more. And there's a, there's a trajectory that he has for my life that will require me to lay aside all the things of this world and say, it's not about me and what I want, but it's what you wanna do through me. And, and God, just go ahead and put some holy things in me, not this synthetic stuff, and allow it over time. Somebody say time. It's a great X factor of what God will do is you just give him time. Quit microwaving your miracles. Can I say that today? Quit microwaving your moment. Sometimes it's in the, well, I just know this. Valley doesn't grow on the mountaintop. Valley grows, uh, I'm sorry, fruit doesn't grow on the mountaintop. Fruit grows in the valleys of my life when I'm just, when no one else is paying attention and I'm just saying to the Lord, I'm trusting you, I'm living right before you, and someday when time comes right, you will, like Galatians 6, 9 says, if I don't give up. What a word for somebody today, if I don't give up.
give up. So here's the word of the devil. Did God really say that you cannot eat of any of these trees? God said, all of these trees you can eat from. But this one tree. In other words, he transplanted a deceitful lie that God is withholding good things from you. And that is why you can, you will live better when you do what you want to do. In other words, don't tell me what to do. Now, how many of you, have you experienced your kids that think what they think is right is better what you think is right and your no is actually cruelty and they're gonna if they could they're gonna report you to child protective services no, not my children they listen to me every time i tell them to do everything all the time yeah, but the way you look Someone at me else i was children too. no no it's it's funny you know the stove the flame on the stove is very very beautiful and I've had little ones run up and I don't have time to sit down and say, let me explain to you why you cannot do that. There's moments as a father, I love them too much. And I say, no, no, no. And I will teach you, but this right here will cause so much damage to you long-term that you think the moments of pleasure of touching that flame is worth and it's not. And I love my kids too much not to discipline them. Yes. Hebrews 12. God disciplines those that he loves. And so if you haven't felt disciplined in a while by God, you might want to check because you could be an illegitimate child. That's your Bible. Not, that's your Bible. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No. And, and, and if you are feeling disciplined, wave at me if that's you today. Um, yeah. Congratulations. God loves you. Yes. And he loves you too much to leave you. And as an earthly father, I do the very best I can with the limited resources and knowledge that I have. But our heavenly father who is perfect, Yes, disciplines. So at which point in a child's age, and it's not like you're a child psychologist, but this is just the question, at which point did you realize that the no's were actually to save you from pain and bring out a better life for you? At which point in your growing up did that happen? Isn't it like for me at least, different seasons. I thought I had it and then I realized, oh no, no, you don't have it as much as you thought you had it. And it's like, God is so patient in spite of how limited I am. I know this, having a real pastor and, and I call you a real pastor to me and, and, and a real person who is further than you, that if you were gonna be wildly transparent, you would swap lives with them in that area if you could. I look at someone who's had a great marriage for 30 years and I want to take advice from them more than someone who's been divorced five times tell me this is how a good relationship is supposed to operate. I don't, I'm sorry, but I don't listen to broke people about how to become wealthy. I just, I'm not trying to be rude, but I want to exchange lives with that person in this area, not physically, but what God has done in them. And, and I'm willing to let that person, you being one of them in my life, say, Hey, Doug, I don't know if you're settling or you're pursuing God's best. Let me call you to something greater than you would call yourself to. And I just want to encourage you, correction isn't wrong when it's done by the right person. And when it comes to my own children, they have to know that above everything, their dad loves them ferociously and would give his life for them. So when I correct them, it's not because I'm trying to ruin their fun. It's because I'm trying to set them up for a future that they can't see yet for themselves. Oh, I see. I love that so much. I, I, I think what you just said is so interesting because I think one of the, the most profound um, anchoring points in life is when you realize all God's knows is not his denials because every one of his yeses and his knows is anchored in love yes. for you. And could I just say sometimes like let's talk about something that might look like sin, sexual immorality, right? 
It's not a no, it's a not yet. And when you put yourself in the alignment of God, so many things that we think of a sin or like, oh, if I do this in this moment, it's not right. It's maybe not a not yet in the plan that God has for you. So be patient. Don't microwave it and watch the beauty of the story unfold as you trust okay, him. Okay, so here's another question. Here's another question. Bible speaks about that same John. He speaks about, I speak to you children, I speak to you young men, and I speak to you fathers and mothers, right? Young woman too. In other words, he talks about a progression of maturing. He says, babies crave milk. He says, those who are new in their faith crave the milk of the word so that you can grow up. Because when kids don't grow up, their desire doesn't change for better things. And their rebellion remains stronger than ever because now they're of age where they tell you, you don't tell me what to do, right? And do you think that our lack of understanding that growing in God is not optional, it's critical? for us coming to a place of understanding and realizing the more we grow. Because he says about the young men, you are young men and young women because the word now lives in you. And because it lives in you, now you can overcome the evil one. Children cannot overcome the evil one. But young men and women that grow in God can overcome the evil one. And fathers and mothers intimately know, and by default, the fathers and mothers, they call the young children and young men and women to a higher place of a fulfillment of life in Christ. So here's my question. Why do you think growing in God has such optional, inconsequential value to us who believe? Wow, that's a question right there, Pastor. Can I say this? I think for so many of us who are bored with the idea of our Christianity, and the reason why, and you won't amen it, you won't clap it, but deep down in your soul, you'll look at it, and it's because you have made this all about you. It's my faith journey, it's my blessing, it's my this, it's my that, and here's the problem that I know. The longer I look in the mirror, the less I like. And the older I get, the way more less I like, the longer I look in the mirror. The more I keep my eyes on me, the less I like about myself. But if I fix my eyes on Jesus and I look for those that are spiritually younger than me. Oh, it's so good. I come to church for two reasons every Sunday. I come to church to give my praise and thanks to God through worship, through the word, through my giving. And I also have eyes open to say, who can I disciple and encourage and edify and give them a reason to know God is still for you. He's not against you. But if I just come to church for what I get out of it, eventually church gets old. Yes. But when I come to church for what I can give, and it's also beautiful when I get something, but I'm not coming to get something, I'm coming to give something, all of a sudden I can't wait for Sunday morning because God is putting people in my path that I can be a father, my wife can be a mother spiritually too. The fear of today's American church is we are birthing an orphanage with a couple employees running it versus families gathering together oh, so and building up younger sons and daughters. What oh. do you think about that? I want to hear your opinion on it. That's damn good. <laughs> That's what I think. I'm sorry, damn is Dutch. It's Dutch. I'm sorry. It's Dutch. That's, yeah, it is. And it's really good. I, I think, I think you just, you just nailed it so well. Is we want microwave stuff. You know, when I met Doug, he was twice the size. He was real chubby. Yeah. <laughs> a fatty boom batty. Uh, I was uh, he, a little he was, heavier. He, oh, yeah, he was chubby. Yeah. I like to run really hard to run I, him over. I really like to eat. <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden there was a change and I met him on Saturday for breakfast and I, I looked at him I go like, dang, I hate your body. Why is it that you look so dang good? I feel pregnant and my clothes doesn't fit and 
what is it in you? And he's telling me when he made the decision and all the dreams and, and I go like, yeah, I did the same thing. Oh, I've got lists of it. And I vacuum my gym and I dust it to this day. I said, but what in you put it into motion? And what did you tell me? I had to have a vision for a life that was beyond my right now gratification. And I thought about the grandchildren I don't have yet and the type of grandfather and example to them that I want to lead. And something in me swelled up to say, you are settling for not God's best in your life. And this is hard. And I think we live in a society that runs from hard things. And I think if you read your Bible, God invites you to the harder things because you find more of his nature in you. And I just went on this journey of saying, I refuse to be a victim of my circumstances. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I'll be a victor. I'm gonna have accountability. I'm going to put resources into it. I'm going to go through all the necessary steps that I preach about on Sunday mornings to people. And I'm going to apply it in a physical way because I believe we are a triune being. You are a mind that needs mental stimulation and growth and challenges. You are a physical body that you have to steward all the days. God numbers your days, but the quality of those days is your determination, what you want to do with it. And I am a spirit and I need to feed all three of these in a healthy way. So at the end of my days, all I want to hear from God is well done, my good and faithful servant. So good. That is so good. Can you imagine God's desire to look at the full picture? Because the Bible says when when you were yet in your mother's womb, he had plans for your life. And I think for many parents whose children are in a drifted place away from the plans and the potential of their life, what you grieve is not who they are, is what they're giving up on and what they can be. You look at them, you don't go like, you're such a loser. You go like, you don't see what I see. And God's thoughts over us is a life of reflecting the image of Christ and overcoming for those of you who want places where you desire something to understand what you desire is not wrong. But if you don't trust the Lord for it, you will have a one night stand for it, but you will pay the price for it and the pain of it because sin is so toxic. Uh, Genesis, God said to Adam, sin is looking at the heart of your door and it's desirous for you and you must conquer it. Otherwise, it will enslave you and conquer you. And it is not about saying, I'm not going to cuss. I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to. It's not about those things. It's about saying, God, your way leads to a better life. And I need to grow so that your desire in me, because David says this, create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore in me a steadfast spirit. Hide your your word in my heart so sin cannot come in. David's asking of God, fortify me to set my eye on your dream. And your dream is the desires that I already have amplified because we are the light of the world that the world needs but the proximity to that light last question Doug if you can leave one thing to all these beautiful people about how much the world needs to not be confused by the word Christian Because when they hear Christian, they don't go like, oh, oh my God, aren't they wonderful people? No. What if, I just want to ask you to imagine for yourself, what if the way you lived was so kind 
so courageous, so loving, so inspiring that people want to know where that came from in you. And instead of you preaching the gospel with your words, you preached it with your life. And that people would see. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I love being in spaces and places where people do not know what my profession is and do not know that I'm a follower of Jesus. And when they find out that I am, they say cuss words afterwards in shock. Because like, are you serious? Oh, bleep. In a good way. Because I didn't make them think of a self-righteous, stuffy, religious, preachy at you, but a kind, servant-minded, loving, encouraging. Where's a need? Let me fill the need. Let me just be a person that is a beacon of hope of the banner and reflecting the light that shined on me 20 years ago. And all I want to do is keep shining it for other people to see it. I want you to pray for us that why should I tell you what to pray? I want you to pray what's in your heart for this beautiful group of people. Would you just outstretch your hands like this as a openness to the Lord? And Father, first of all, it's been 20 years since you've allowed me to pastor people. And I, I do repent before this congregation that for so long, we thought it was just enough to tell you to come to church and just serve and just go back to your regularly scheduled program. I know pastor's heart and I speak on my behalf too, God, that there is such a bigger world of people that you want us to reach and that every one of us who call ourselves disciples, let us disciple. Let us be people who are carriers of the light and reflecting it to a world that is so dark and needs your light to shine. So God, first we invite you to shine in the dark crevices of our soul and call us to something greater than we would settle for naturally. God, tear down every idol that we've had, every image that we've made that we say is you instead of allowing you to show us who you are and we change to you instead of asking you to change to us. So God, we just give you permission to offend our selfish ways and teach us how to be selfless because here's what I know, Lord. Selfish people ruin the world yes but selfless people can change it yes. let the father's house in this community in this region be such a selfless church that change happens just by de facto because they show up in the atmosphere and they're making a difference in their schools and their workplaces with their families let them be bringers and carriers of your light as we shine bright to a world that is desperate for a Jesus who is so very real in your name I pray amen amen there's so Amen. much more God to bless the story. You. Come on. We are not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. There's so much more to the story. Cause you're not done with me. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the beautiful love of God our Father oh and such the beautiful gift of his Holy Spirit as a friend and a light and a helper be with you oh may God silence the lies over our minds oh may his Spirit remove the guilt and the shame and this dark cloud of catastrophizing your future. May God fill your mouth with laughter. May he fill your soul with peace. May the Lord create in us pure hearts and restore in us upright spirits and a vision to fall in love with the light that reflects in darkness. God give you peace. Be blessed, church.
Be blessed. Pastor Doug, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Gonna done with.